Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Andrew Smith reports on how the U.S. government may change race and ethnicity classifications. Faith Perlow explains the difference between the words irregular and abnormal. Later, we listen to "A White Heron" by Sarah Orne Jewett. But first, the United States is considering updating. Racial and ethnic categories recognized in the country for the first time since 1997. The government's Office of Management and Budget (OMB) plans to decide on the new categories next year. It is holding three meetings open to the public this week to discuss the issue. Supporters of the proposed changes say the new categories will help the government get more exact information about the country's population. The changes would create a new category for people of Middle Eastern and North African ancestry, also known by the acronym MENA. They are now classified as white, but say they have been undercounted. Another change would combine questions about race and ethnicity into one. With the changes, the government would try to get more detailed answers by asking about country of origin. Besides helping to give a picture of the U.S. population, the categories are used to enforce civil rights, voting rights, and employment discrimination laws. The U.S. Census Bureau studies the population. It carries out a count every ten years and collects other information. About the country's people, the study includes questions about race and ethnicity, and must follow OMB definitions of such. Currently, it includes five categories of race. They include white, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian. And Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. The most recent census study was in 2020. The Census Bureau website states that the categories generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country. And the agency notes that people may choose to report. More than one race to indicate their racial mixture. The OMB has collected more than four thousand three hundred comments about the possible changes. Shalini Parekh wrote that she wants a way for South Asian people to identify themselves differently than East Asians from places like China. Or Japan. She said that when these groups are put into only one category, it is harder to identify issues that relate to one group but not another. Naim Wei said he is tired of people mixing the terms African American and Black. He and others. Want to distinguish descendants of enslaved people from black immigrants from Africa who were not enslaved. Mixing 
African American with black has blurred what it means to be an African American in this country, he said. Way works for a pharmaceutical company in Athens, Georgia, and spoke about the issue in a telephone interview. However, some people disagree with expanding categories and classifications. They say that could weaken the idea of a single American identity and increase separation between groups. By creating and deepening subnational identities, the government further contributes to the decline of one national American identity, wrote Mike Gonzalez, an expert at the Heritage Foundation, a research and education group based in Washington, D.C. He commented on the OMB webpage seeking public opinions on the proposed changes. Byron Haskins is a retired government worker from Lansing, Michigan. He suggests the U.S. stop using racial and ethnic identifications. Haskins says the practice supports the continuation of deeply rooted, unjust social systems and ideas. Instead, he said people should be able to identify themselves as they wish. You need to search for the truth and not just stay with the old categories because someone decided that is what we decided, Haskins said. But Huda Meraway thinks that having more categories could be helpful. She described herself as a 73-year-old Arab-American woman. When I go to the doctor's office, I do not feel they have the information necessary to understand my medical history or my culture, she said. For all these reasons, I want to be counted as who I am, not as white. I'm Andrew Smith. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about two common synonyms, or words that have similar meanings, abnormal and irregular. Hi, VOA Learning English. I am Ria from China. I wish to know the difference between the words abnormal and irregular. Is there any other word that has a similar meaning of irregular? Thanks, Ria. Thank you, Ria, for this great question. While abnormal and irregular are often used in similar situations, there are some notable differences. Let's consider abnormal first. Abnormal is an adjective, meaning not normal, usual, or average. It suggests that something is troublesome or a problem. For example, his blood tests showed an abnormal level of T cells. The veterinarian said a viral infection caused the marmot's abnormal behavior. Normal is often used in describing growth or behavior. These are processes that are not the same all of the time. But experience and knowledge form our understanding of what they are. Abnormal is often used to describe what is outside our experience of what normal is. Let's move on to irregular. As an adjective, irregular has several different meanings. The first describes something that does not happen at regular, predictable times. It can describe an activity that happens for different lengths of time 
or that happens once in a while. Amanda's work schedule was very irregular. Sometimes she worked nights, other times she worked during the day. The second meaning describes appearance that is not even, straight, or smooth. It can also describe something that does not form a regular pattern. The coast of the state is quite irregular with its rocky hills. A third meaning has to do with observing regular rules, laws, or behavior. The bank failed because of irregular investment practices. In English grammar, there are irregular action words, or verbs. In many languages, verbs have different endings, to agree with number or tense. For example, the verb eat is an irregular verb. The past tense is not eated, it is ate. The past participle is eaten. Other words can also have irregular differences from the usual patterns of grammar. Irregular can be a noun too. It can describe a person belonging to a military force that is outside of the national armed forces of a country. Such forces usually do not have the same command structure and are often called paramilitary forces. Irregular can also mean a piece of clothing that is a little damaged or not exactly perfect and is sold in some stores at a lower price than normal. So, while these two words are often used as synonyms, irregular has more meanings and is often used as both an adjective and a noun. And it might be a better word choice in some situations, depending on what you want to say. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Rhea. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. You know, Faith, there's something I always think about when I hear the word abnormal. Oh yeah? What's that, Dan? It's from the movie Young Frankenstein, which is a comedy based off the famous Frankenstein story. If you know the story, Dr. Frankenstein puts a brain inside the body of a dead person and brings him back to life, and then it becomes a monster. So when young Frankenstein puts the brain into the body, he asks his assistant whose brain it is. The brain was supposed to just come from a normal man, but his assistant said it came from a person named Abby. Abby Normal. Because he didn't want to admit, he accidentally gave the doctor an abnormal brain and created a monster that is seven feet tall. It's a silly joke, but I think it's pretty funny. Yes, I've seen that movie. When young Frankenstein starts slowly putting the words Abby and normal together, that was the best. The word abnormal is typically more negative. In that something that is abnormal is often unusual in a very bad way. So in Frankenstein, the abnormal brain caused the person to become a monster. Someone who is acting abnormally may be acting strange or odd in a way that is negative. Another more common word that can be used as a synonym is weird. That word is still very negative, but a little less strong and more appropriate for some situations. Yes, abnormal sounds a little more serious and formal. There's nothing wrong with being weird, though. Thanks for stopping by, Faith. The forest was full of shadows as a little girl hurried through it one summer evening in June. It was already eight o'clock and Sylvie wondered if her grandmother would be angry with her for being so late. Every evening, Sylvie left her grandmother's house at 5.30 to bring their cow home. 
The old animal spent her days out in the open country, eating sweet grass. It was Sylvie's job to bring her home to be milked. When the cow heard Sylvie's voice calling her, she would hide among the bushes. This evening, it had taken Sylvie longer than usual to find her cow. The child hurried the cow through the dark forest, following a narrow path that led to her grandmother's home. The cow stopped at a small stream to drink. As Sylvie waited, she put her bare feet in the cold, fresh water of the stream. She had never before been alone in the forest as late as this. The air was soft and sweet. Sylvie felt as if she were a part of the gray shadows and silver leaves that moved in the evening breeze. She began thinking how it was only a year ago that she came to her grandmother's farm. Before that, she had lived with her mother and father in a dirty, crowded factory town. One day, Sylvie's grandmother had visited them and had chosen Sylvie from all her brothers and sisters to be the one to help her on her farm in Vermont. The cow finished drinking, and as the nine-year-old child hurried through the forest to the home she loved, she thought again about the noisy town where her parents still lived. Suddenly, the air was cut by a sharp whistle not far away. Sylvie knew it wasn't a friendly bird's whistle. It was the determined whistle of a person. She forgot the cow and hid in some bushes. But she was too late. Hello, little girl, a young man called out cheerfully. How far is it to the main road? Sylvie was trembling as she whispered, Two miles. She came out of the bushes and looked up into the face of a tall young man carrying a gun. The stranger began walking with Sylvie as she followed her cow through the forest. I've been hunting for birds, he explained, but I've lost my way. Do you think I can spend the night at your house? Sylvie didn't answer. She was glad they were almost home. She could see her grandmother standing near the door of the farmhouse. When they reached her, the stranger put down his gun and explained his problem to Sylvie's smiling grandmother. Of course you can stay with us, she said. We don't have much, but you're welcome to share what we have. Now, Sylvie, get a plate for the gentleman. After eating, they all sat outside. The young man explained he was a scientist who collected birds. Do you put them in a cage? Sylvie asked. No, he answered slowly. I shoot them and stuff them with special chemicals to preserve them. I have over 100 different kinds of birds from all over the United States in my study at home. Sylvie knows a lot about birds, too, her grandmother said proudly. She knows the forest so well, the wild animals come and eat bread right out of her hands. So, Sylvie knows all about birds. Maybe she can help me then, the young man said. I saw a white heron not far from here two days ago. I've been looking for it ever since. It's a very rare bird, the little white heron. Have you seen it too? 
he asked Sylvie. But Sylvie was silent. You would know it if you saw it, he added. It's a tall, strange bird with soft white feathers and long, thin legs. It probably has its nest at the top of a tall tree. Sylvie's heart began to beat fast. She knew that strange white bird. She had seen it on the other side of the forest. The young man was staring at Sylvie. I would give ten dollars to the person who showed me where the white heron is. That night, Sylvie's dreams were full of all the wonderful things she and her grandmother could buy for ten dollars. Sylvie spent the next day in the forest with the young man. He told her a lot about the birds they saw. Sylvie would have had a much better time if the young man had left his gun at home. She could not understand why he killed the birds he seemed to like so much. She felt her heart tremble every time he shot an unsuspecting bird as it was singing in the trees. But Sylvie watched the young man with eyes full of admiration. She had never seen anyone so handsome and charming. A strange excitement filled her heart, a new feeling the little girl did not recognize. Love. At last evening came. They drove the cow home together. Long after the moon came out and the young man had fallen asleep, Sylvie was still awake. She had a plan that would get the ten dollars for her grandmother and make the young man happy. When it was almost time for the sun to rise, she quietly left her house and hurried through the forest. She finally reached a huge pine tree, so tall it could be seen for many miles around. Her plan was to climb to the top of the pine tree. She could see the whole forest from there. She was sure she would be able to see where the white heron had hidden its nest. Sylvie's bare feet and tiny fingers grabbed the tree's rough trunk. Sharp, dry branches scratched at her like cat's claws. The pine tree's sticky sap made her fingers feel stiff and clumsy as she climbed higher and higher. The pine tree seemed to grow taller the higher that Sylvie climbed. The sky began to brighten in the east. Sylvie's face was like a pale star when at last she reached the tree's highest branch. The golden sun's rays hit the green forest. Two hawks flew together in slow-moving circles far below Sylvie. Sylvie felt as if she could go flying among the clouds, too. To the west, she could see other farms and forests. Suddenly, Sylvie's dark gray eyes caught a flash of white that grew larger and larger. A bird with broad white wings and a long, slender neck flew past Sylvie and landed on a pine branch below her. The white heron smoothed its feathers and called to its mate, sitting on their nest in a nearby tree. Then it lifted its wings and flew away. Sylvie gave a long sigh. She knew the wild bird secret now. Slowly, she began her dangerous trip down the ancient pine tree. She did not dare to look down and tried to forget that her fingers hurt and her feet were bleeding. All she wanted to think about 
was what the stranger would say to her when she told him where to find the heron's nest. As Sylvie climbed slowly down the pine tree, the stranger was waking up back at the farm. He was smiling because he was sure from the way the shy little girl had looked at him that she had seen the white heron. About an hour later, Sylvie appeared. Both her grandmother and the young man stood up as she came into the kitchen. The splendid moment to speak about her secret had come. But Sylvie was silent. Her grandmother was angry with her. Where had she been? The young man's kind eyes looked deeply into Sylvie's own dark gray ones. He could give Sylvie and her grandmother ten dollars. He had promised to do this, and they needed the money. Besides, Sylvie wanted to make him happy. But Sylvie was silent. She remembered how the white heron came flying through the golden air and how they watched the sun rise together from the top of the world. Sylvie could not speak. She could not tell the heron's secret and give its life away. The young man went away disappointed later that day. Sylvie was sad. She wanted to be his friend. He never returned. But many nights Sylvie heard the sound of his whistle as she came home with her grandmother's cow. Were the birds better friends than their hunter might have been? Who can know? <laughs>